Besides having built this amazing training company and being great at selling from a stage, Simone has also built a company, a community, GTEx, with 1200, over 1200 paying members. And uh, this element of the evening, it's called Founders Fireside Chat. It's like where we have a conversation and we try to learn basically from your journey of building a community, of building a business starting from community. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe you want to share a little bit about the origin story about that because the way you started your whole business was with community and connections at its core, right? Yeah, uh, I was very lucky that I met um, an old Hungarian man, uh, which an uh, incredible business owner, and uh, he told me while I was working in his shop, uh, if you build your community, your community will build your business. And that was one of the most profound lessons that I've ever had because uh, his entire philosophy was all about community building. And so I went into business uh, at 23 when I started out, uh, straight away thinking about community. And uh, my company is GTEx, uh, and it uh, stands for Growing Together Exponentially. That's what the company is for, stands for. And we started running uh, events, a bit like this one, uh, where we're bringing people together. And uh, at the time, uh, both my business partner and I were uh, really interested in personal development. Uh, we started attending personal development events when we were 22, 23. And we were always the youngest one in the room because uh, 12 years ago, it wasn't that popular. Um, it wasn't that mainstream. And we decided to bring people together and connect them with the, the speakers that we knew. So I managed to negotiate and finding a room. There is a, 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 an organic farm, which is a city farm in London called Hackney City Farm in the center of London. I negotiated with them a room for seven events for free. And uh, now I had the room and I had to do something about it. <laughs> so I called a friend of mine and I said, hey, I got these rooms for seven events. Should we do something together? And he said, yes. And that's when uh, we started our first, uh, we put up our first event where we had the four people the first time. Two were the speakers. <laughs> <laughs> one was my business partner's father. <laughs> and the other one was the only person who came along, which we chained in the chair and said, no, you're not going to move from here. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we ended up that series of about seven events. I think the last one we had about 20 to 30 people, 25, I think. And that, uh, what, that's what started the, the event company and uh, the whole community and the, the idea of who are we bringing together. Yeah, so the interesting thing about that is you started with just organizing events, providing value and bringing people together. Mm. And from there, you basically got all the opportunities and connections to grow your business to what it is now. Yes, exactly, because uh, at the beginning, you know, we weren't even making any offers. We weren't even selling anything. So we were running free <coughs> events because we, we wanted to do it. We loved doing it. We wanted to bring people together. And it was just a cool thing to do. <laughs> and that's how we started. And then we had the idea of creating a mastermind. And uh, we started pitching the mastermind. And for, the, for five events, no one bought it. It was 120 pounds for six months. <laughs> and no one even bought it, but we didn't even know what the freak we were doing. <laughs> I cannot blame them. But then we had one person that came to one of the events and he loved what we did and he invited eight of his friends to come along. They had a group where they were going to different events and they were going to all of them and they were inviting each other, and then going out for dinner. So that week was our event. And we pitched the mastermind. The guy said, bought the mastermind. All his eight friends bought the mastermind as well. And then we had paying clients. It was the first time we made more than 1,000 pounds in a night. We're like, fuck, this works. <laughs> like, we can, we can do something with this. It was the first time that actually someone paid us for, for that and that building. But it came from building the community and then adding value to that community or adding services to them. And then they were recommending other people, and that's how we started, uh, how we started growing, by doing uh, a lot of volume of events. Yeah, it's interesting that you were doing this for a long time, 
and at, at some point you needed to reach, I guess, that one type of individual yeah. who changed everything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sometimes it's just like one person that makes the entire difference. I think that everyone here can think about that one person in their life, on their business that uh, was a focal point and uh, help them maybe get a job or get in, getting their idea off the ground or that client that uh, sorry, made your business. We all have those examples and uh, that, that was that for me. Right, and you needed to have that volume to reach that one person out of the, the mass yeah, of people, so, right? Sometimes just like... Because you didn't know who it was going to be, so all you could do is like provide uh, value, organize events. Yeah, absolutely. I, vo volume is, a, is important. Volume is important because you never know who you meet. You never, and that's a, if you're going back to webinars, webinars are a great way to build community. Because uh, if they like you as a leader when you're delivering the presentation, they're more likely also to want to be part of what you're creating, even if they're not buying immediately. And uh, that's the same in the, in, in the webinar space, in the event space, is a way to, to bring people together. That's also what a webinar does. It brings, it brings people together. And if you have a chance with what you do to bring people together, to bring your clients together, it will create a much more uh, stronger kind of loyalty to the company as well, but also will create a lot of opportunities. Yeah, and what sounds like really helped was you were already interested in a type of events and meeting a certain type of, type of people that uh, were the target audience of your events, right? So even though you weren't financially successful the first, whatever, five, six, seven events, yeah, I mean, I was, we weren't financially successful the, four, five, the first four years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, let alone, uh, let alone the first eight events. I, I mean, we made a thousand pound that event and then we had another three events where we sold nothing and another event when maybe one person bought. So uh, we, we, I think it was the fourth year was when we made 20,000 pound. Let's go. And there were two of us. And we were paying venues on top of it, so we were actually losing money. And then the, the fifth year, that's where we went from uh, 20,000 to 120,000, the year after to 250,000, then half a million, and uh, then we went to 700,000, and then COVID hit. <laughs> so we <laughs> went back <laughs> on that side. Mm. But that was, a, that was interesting. Uh, on, uh, uh, until the fifth year, for, for us, that was a turning point, the fifth year of uh, running volume of events. And that what put us on the map. And talking about trust, people started trusting us and, and buying from us. Well, before they were. How did you mentally like, go through these first years where you were giving a lot and a lot of energy and uh, not really gaining anything like, of financial value back? I was, uh, I was getting what I, what, I, what I wanted anyway. I, I loved doing it. Um, but you had a, a job next to it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, so you didn't have to survive from No, 100%. Uh, so I, I was very creative. Uh, I managed to barter my rent and food uh, in London, which was really good. So I wasn't paying for rent and food in London, which saves a lot of money. Uh, I, with the guy, the, the Hungarian guy that I met, he owned a health food store. And I was shopping with my groceries there. And I remember one night uh, I was supposed to move house and move uh, house with my girlfriend, my, my ex-girlfriend at the time, my ex-girlfriend. And we split up the day before I was going to move in with her. <laughs> and I already left the other place that I had and I had no money for a deposit. <laughs> so I was in a bit of a tricky situation. So I went to the shop and I asked that, that guy that I knew, I said, hey, I'm looking for a part-time role. Can you help me out? He said, no, I don't need any help here, but uh, I have a place, uh, you can stay at mine, and then when you have the money, you pay me. I was like, thank you, <laughs> oh my God. And then he had a problem in his leg, and so what I said to him, I said, what about I work for you two days a week, and uh, I don't pay the rent in exchange? And that worked for him because he needed help, and that worked for me, and I've been in that arrangement for four years that allowed me to build a business. And during the day, I started delivering workshops in schools. So I actually was building my speaking business in schools and uh, uh, I was delivering to about 100 to 150 schools every single year, um, doing uh, workshops for other companies. 
And that's how I was paying everything. I was paying GTEx, I was paying my rent, not my rent, but I was paying my, my life, how I was paying the venues, how we were investing in the business. And uh, then to that point where it was okay, the business was making more money, so actually working the two days in that shop was more of a distraction, so then I dropped it. And I dropped all the work in schools just to focus on the event company. Yeah, I think like one important lesson in this story is it might take a while before your community actually becomes financially successful. Mm -hmm. So choose something that you enjoy doing, like you enjoyed hosting those events and the people you were meeting already. Right. If you don't have that, it becomes a very difficult four years to. Uh... This is a, it's a great point, because if you're talking about community uh, and going back to the advice that Mihai, which is the Hungarian guy, gave me was build your community and your community will build your business. It was not have a business and then build your community to serve your business. It's a different thing. Mm -hmm. I, the community needs to be served for the community as a whole. And then you can make offers, you can give them something they want, some will buy, some will not, but the focus is still on nurturing the community as a community, not as a function to monetization. Right. Because if people feel I'm just being used because this can grow your business, then they will be, they, they will not want to be part of it after, after a while. Yeah, I feel that's happening a lot, right? People who are like a worst buzzword, like we need to have a community and they start to do it just because they want to sell some more products or get some extra revenue. It's not authentic. 100%. And of course, it's important for the community to be sustainable, you know, but uh, uh, at the same time, for a community leader, Mm -hmm. Whether you're thinking about running your own communities, uh, it's all about the members. Mm -hmm. What did you do at your events? Mm -hmm. What were your events like? Uh, we had, uh, very similar to this one, what we did, we had a speaker that will come and deliver a presentation. And then we'll split in different breakout groups and discuss. Uh, and then uh, the members of the people that were there were discussing how they could help each other implement what they've learned. And then we were out and having drinks uh, or going for a meal. And uh, we ended up uh, after the fifth year, no, after the, the fourth year, then we started running 200 events a year. So we're doing volume. At some point, I had a great arrangement with a venue. And so then we started doing about two, three events a week. And we did a thousand events in five years. Uh, amazing. <laughs> Freaking love that. And, but it was a lot. It was a lot of work. I was burning out consistently every six months <laughs> because it wasn't sustainable at all. Mm. And I wasn't traveling like this digital nomad thing. It wasn't like no way. I was there in London running the events and marketing the next one and doing the next one. But that consistency paid off. And were the same people coming to your events or was it, were you always getting new people joining? Um, the, the aim was to have new people join, but they, we had a lot of regulars. We had a lot of regulars. Yeah. I think one interesting other thing to uh, discuss is even though you don't build a community for the benefits that you get, as a side effect of authentically wanting to build a community and uh, helping people ahead in their journey, mm. you get a lot of benefits, right? I personally experienced like a lot of business speaking opportunities, friendships, like everything seems to come more easily. Maybe you can share some examples of what happened to you. Oh, 100%. Uh, uh, I mean, once we reached, uh, uh, once we started going out, because when you're talking about regulars, the problem that we had financially was we didn't focus on bringing a lot of new people in. And so the people that were part of the community, maybe they were already buying, but it wasn't enough in terms of numbers to sustain the business that we wanted to build. And running events, you know, if you don't have a venue that helps you sponsor, is expensive. Um, uh, you have a lot of cost uh, on it. So then what we started doing is to focus on, okay, now we need to bring new people. So we started focusing on bringing new people. We knew that we had something that, were, that was working. We had a solid structure. We had a solid foundation. And uh, that's what created the shift. But a beautiful thing about a community is that once the trust is built and the relationship is built, then you have clients for life. Uh, we built, um, uh, you know, all our, when we launch a new product or a new service, the first people that they buy, they're the people that bought from us uh, six or seven years ago that are still part of the community. Um, when we launched a, a, a done-for-you service for doing the webinar implementation, where we do funnels and sales funnel done-for-you, built another company for it, mess 
told to the people in our community, and we made 25 grand in a day just because there was that trust that was built over the years with the community. We started investing in another, in another company, which is a public speaking training company, because people then need webinar and it's also public speaking training, so it made sense to invest there. And uh, that company, on, we sent one email, we made 10,000 pounds with an email, about 12,000 pounds with an email. So long term it pays off, but it's all about making the members feel, create an environment where the members want to be part of it. And uh, showing them that you are there for them and that you're there for the long term. And then after they realize that, then you have, you have clients for life. Because, and those, they, they, they call more people, so then referrals becomes, when you have a community, becomes the easier game. Because, you have, hey, come and be part of this, sure. Um, it's like whatever products or service you're going to launch, it's 10 times easier to get, new to get people to purchase 100%. that because you already have the community. 100%, you already have the pool. So now we have about 1,200 paying clients that we had over the years. So whenever I launch something, I never have a problem finding finding customers, but it, it took it took time. Yeah. So what exactly or how how exactly do you define a community that you're talking about? Is it more like that one place where you have people and you can engage them and stuff, or is it more like a list of people that you have some other leads that you that have bought from you in the past? And yeah. Yeah. Um, so how, it means how do you find the members to invite members for the community? I don't know. So we, the, yeah, the community, the community are a community of coaches and speakers. Mm -hmm. This is the community that we have. So people that are speaking, they are doing coaching, they're doing consulting. This is the community that we are building. And uh, so whenever I find places with other coaches and consultants, then I invite them in and say, hey, do you want to see what it's like here, how we can support you, and how the community can support you, and then making sure that they, they become part of it. A hundred percent. I think we're going to talk a bit more. Yeah, later member to on member this. engagement. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. How do you keep them engaged? Do, do you want to talk about this now, or do you have other questions? Because I know this was. Yeah. The, so I, I think um, I also want to cover some things for people who want to build their own community. And you touched on a couple of interesting things. One of them being partnerships with venues. Like actually, the fact that we're here, it is a partnership. Like Jana from uh, Start Doc has helped us to set this up. Like we have this venue and. There's people from both the No More Networking community and from the Stardog community, and we all win, we all benefit. So, yeah, launching a community, partnerships is like... Partnership is vital for everything, yeah. because uh, what, what you get with partnerships, uh, if, uh, you can use it for webinars, for community building, but what you get with partnership is a, is a trust. With people pay you first with their time, then with their trust, then with their money, then with their words. So, the trust is the first form of the second form of currency that people pay you with. When you have someone else saying, "Hey, I've got this partner coming in," there is a borrowing of trust. I'm already part of here. They recommend I trust this person. They recommend this other person, so I trust the other person as well. I trust the other organization. So that's why I really focus on partnerships in terms of main lead generation strategy because it's the quickest route to conversion that I found from I don't know you to let me buy from you. And uh, to build a community, what we started doing uh, is creating partnerships with uh, mm, not other communities, but other businesses that uh, didn't have a community. Because the good thing, if you want to create a good partnership, it needs to be a win, it needs to be a synergy. Someone needs to bring something to the table that the other person is not bringing. So if I'm going to partner up with another community that offers the same thing that I offer, what I'm actually doing is taking people away from their community to offer the same thing. However, if uh, there is synergy, for example, hey, we don't offer events, you come in, offer the events to the members, there is a synergy here. Then that's where a good partnership is created. And so we started doing this kind of, and that's a, this kind of partnerships with other organizations that didn't have communities to bring them here and then to create, as you mentioned, which we're going to talk later, that member-to-member -member engagement. Yeah, and that's on like a somewhat bigger level, but it can be also smaller. For example, I organize events for entrepreneurs, which are called Founders Table, and it includes a dinner. So every time I need a location, I ask the people in the group for recommendations for a restaurant and for introductions um, mm. to get the group together 
I also ask them, okay, do you know other people who might be interested in an event like that? So it's really like both partnerships with other businesses and communities, but also with the individuals in your community. You can ask them for help. 100%. I mean, uh, uh, the partnership that I had with, uh, um, with a, we had a partnership with a LinkedIn expert that we did, and uh, it brought us more than $150,000 in, uh, in revenues. Um, collected revenues, about 80, rest was payment plans. And it was, uh, they were a LinkedIn trainer. They promoted our webinar training. And uh, the reason why that partnership was created is because uh, that person attended our webinar training. She said, oh my God, I love this, this is amazing. Got great results. And then said, okay, actually I want to promote you. So can I become a partner? So what you will find that some of the community members that you will have, now they will become partners and they will bring you new clients, they will bring you leads, which is the other um, aspect to consider. Now you will find, not everyone, there will be a minority of people within the community, but you will find some people that now they're going to consistently bring you leads and uh, become uh, real assets uh, in the community also for, to help you generate revenues. And, and then the other thing about members is uh, members, that they believe in something, they love, they will volunteer for things. They will do things for free for you. I've done so many things for free for communities that were part of just because I believed in them. And I'm sure that here we might have all done things for free for other communities that we believe just because, hey, I believe in what they're doing. I just want to help you out. What can I do? All the people that came to our events, we didn't have money to pay the crew that was doing the registration table and all these kind of things. They were friends and people that we met or people that were in the community that they just wanted to support us. Um, yeah. You had a question? Yeah. Uh, speaking <coughs> about partnerships, so mm. do you have any um, strategy or advice or thing that you've done before for getting partnerships that are at a higher level than you are? So like, for example, if you want to get, if you want to work with someone who is an influencer in your yeah. field and they have like, say, community of 500,000 people. Yeah, I got it, I got it. You know, you know. Yeah, so it is a, this is a different, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, on this call partnership because we're doing a fireside chat on community. So this becomes another <laughs> complete conversation. The short answer is everyone wants their time and everyone wants something for someone that has already a bigger reach. So they come or everyone that has already a certain level of success, they comes already guarded because people want to take from them. It's just the nature of the league that you're playing at. Uh, so for me, as I've been doing uh, work, do work for them for free. I work for them, I work for free for, for free. So if I want to reach out to someone, I say, hey, let me build your webinar. So we have a service where we uh, do webinar funnels done for you. It's 20 grand. We manage the entire funnels for a year uh, for that. I said, hey, I'll do this for you. It's 20 grand. You don't have to pay me a penny. If you want, after I deliver this, then we, you can do this for me. That's generally my way. I find because I build a relationship much faster and it's easier to get a yes, a way in. But yeah, well, and there is also, um, like maybe an individual has a lot of one thing, like maybe a lot of money or a lot of followers, but sometimes you can provide something else that they don't have. Oh, uh, I built a partnership recently with someone who has a much bigger audience than me because we had a conversation, part of a mastermind call that we were both part of. It was actually an informal meeting and we ended up being in the same breakout room online. I knew from him uh, about 10 years ago, I saw him at an event and uh, so much bigger person like in terms of size and reach of, the, of his business and audience. And they were talking, I said, oh, I'm looking to, to run a, a cruise. I connected him with Johannes because he wanted to run his own cruise. And I said, hey, I, I know someone who actually makes a, a, runs a cruise company for more than six, seven years. Let me mm -hmm. connect you with him. Connected him with Johannes. He said, hey, thank you very much. This connection saved my cruise. I really appreciate it. What can I do for you? Mm -hmm. So now he's promoting my webinar to his own audience. Uh, and he has more than 100,000 people in the database. <laughs> yes, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, so, yeah, mm. that's. Yeah, just to, to close the whole partnership um, idea, because I, I work a lot with partnerships as well. But regarding the webinar part specifically, like, 
what do you give in return for people to promote your partnership? Because it's quite hard to mm. know who's coming and then who's converting, so you cannot really offer like commission or something like when you offer Is that okay? Because I know this conversation now is moving towards partnership. Is that okay if we talk uh, after I'll, I'll answer this conversation? This, yeah. this, because uh, it's a much longer answer than, yeah, yeah. <laughs> than I think we have time for. This is literally opening other kind of worms on yeah, yeah. So I'll ask you a question, but just later on that. Yeah. So let's say you're at a stage where you organize your first events, people show up to your events, they have a great time, the community is growing, it's financially successful. Um, still, sometimes you are the person that maybe is the glue in the community, like you attracted them all in. And then you get the issue of, okay, it, becomes, it can become very dependent on one person, the community. Yes. Um, I think it's really important to know, if you don't like people, <laughs> don't build a community. <laughs> Building a community is not for everyone. There are some people that they just don't uh, like creating connections. And there is nothing wrong about them. It's just how someone is for a personality, because building a community requires effort. It's all about giving with, at the beginning, having very little in return. The amount of work, and Marcel can testify, mm. <laughs> to build a community, sending people reminders, hey, come here, whether they are paying or non-paying members, is it, definitely a lot of work. So you arrive to a point, though, we are now the community still running, and of course you are the glue of the community, uh, that's where you stuck and start getting people in place. So what we found, uh, we, we, every time, now is, is one of our processes, we find people within the community that naturally they step into leadership positions. And you'll see them. Someone that comes to you and says, hey, can I run this? Oh, I've got this idea. Or I remember we were running, uh, a, um, this is in the online space because all this translates also in building online communities because now we, all our communities are online. Uh, we were running a, a program and there was this person that started translate, uh, that started creating uh, uh, transcripts uh, without even asking for all the videos that we were doing. And it was one of the clients, and I'm like, oh, great, you, come. Um, or, they, or there was another person that started saying, hey, why don't we create accountability groups and just on their own, decided to manage different accountability groups within the community. Well, this is awesome. You, mm -hmm. come in. So now we started seeing people that have this kind of initiative and they naturally are the glue because then we start giving them roles and then the, the, the shift becomes, you're still never gonna be able if it is a community based on a personal brand to completely step out because you're building personal relationship and people stay in the community because of the relationship that they build with you. But is a, the role becomes transitioning the focus on creating more member-to-member -member relationship because now it's not anymore about you, but it's about, okay, the members-to-members -members because if they build more relationship within members, they care less about you. And also build finding those people that can help managing and still bring people together with the same energy that uh, the founder had. Mm -hmm. Because the problem is not finding a community manager. The problem is finding a community manager that has the same energy values and passion of the founder because uh, someone can resonate with the founder, someone community manager gets put in, it's a different one. It's like, no, this is what, not what I signed up for. Let me find another community now. Yeah. Do you have some um, suggestions to increase member to member engagements? Yeah. Uh, there are some things that we follow, for example, even in our community and all, doing it online is even more difficult because uh, there is, it's more difficult to build stronger relationship. Actually, building a community mm -hmm. offline is easier than building a community online. It creates more loyalty. But the same strategy can be, can be applied. So one is a, for the leader to facilitate introductions. You know the members. So is the leader or the community manager that connects the member that they should connect. Uh, then the other part is to create opportunities for the member to connect in a non-structured environment. Because for example, it can be a dinner, like when you're doing dinners. Mm -hmm. It's not a training, it's not a talk, it's a dinner. We're having a dinner and we can meet people. It's an experience. It's an experience. Um, taking people away 
from their normal environment to do something different that helps the member-to-member -member engagement. Uh, creating, um, uh, showcasing members. So mm -hmm. doing member showcase. For example, something that we do is that every month we have uh, two members that we showcase to the entire community. And then that month they become the focal point and the, all the members are encouraged to connect with them and build relationship with them. Uh, these yeah, are some so of the things that we, that we do. It feels like the members are part of what you create, right? They're not just a, like a spectator, but by putting them in the spotlight, they're actually part of the creation process. 100%, 100%, because now the focus, uh, uh, what I mean this conversation earlier, building a community is a, like, what is the reason, like, if, if I ask you, what would you look for in a community? Like, what, why would you join a community? What would, you, would your answer be? Connection. Connection. Friends. Friends. Like-minded people. There are so many answers, but like growth as well. Depends on what the community is. Depends on what, what you want, right? So everyone, everyone will have... Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, everyone will give a different reason why they want to join the community, but it's about mainly that connection element. Mm -hmm. uh, and mainly that find, that even if it is the growth, it's the growth through like-minded people. Yeah. And that needs to become the main focus, always be kept this, the main focus of the community. Is uh, this decision I'm making, is this thing I'm providing, supporting the connection between members? Yes or no? If it's no, scrap it. If it's yes, great, put it in. So these are some, these are some ideas. Yeah. Uh, there is one thing actually we've started doing, um, which worked really well, is doing collaborative articles or panels with our members. So every month we pick, uh, I'm big in giving back and raising awareness of social issues that there are. So every month uh, we have a list of social issues that we want to raise awareness for. And then we ask our community members to answer a questionnaire, uh, for example, uh, to then create an article for it, a collaborative article. So for example, we had a month, uh, um, this month we are showcasing members that are carers and they're running a business. So they're caring full-time or part-time for their family and uh, they're running a business. It's a very different way of running a business if you are a carer, if you're caring full-time or part-time for someone. And so what now we are giving them a spotlight uh, is these people in the community and uh, they are sharing, they are writing an article all together, giving tips, uh, sharing their experiences. We do a podcast together. So now those people that might not connect, now they connect to that, to that activity and the other people now they can understand what they're going through and connect with them in that way. That's something that we started doing recently and this helped a lot. I also wanted to say uh, that the community itself, when you asked about like, also about like delegation or like widening, the, making it wider, right? Bigger community. The community itself is not only the leader anymore. So if, if it's growing, so it, it stops being a leader, but it stops being a, starts to be an organism. 100%. Where, mm -hmm. where some of the people, they can actually come for different people, but not for the uh, leader of this community. And if you are just giving the community more freedom to organize their own kind of initiatives, you can step away very fast because you can only run like only one event. And that could be like a founder's table where people are just gathering around and people know that you are there. But all other events are run by other different people from the community mm -hmm. who, as you said, they, I, they I agree with, volunteer, yeah. they don't volunteer, they, it is a... I agree with you, but it's a bit more complex. Uh, I mean, uh, it depends on, uh, as I mentioned, not everyone, uh, like everyone in that moment becomes a voice of that community, representative of their community. Yes. Which means uh, if they do something, if they're not good at what they're doing, or they might just have an idea, but they don't know what they're doing, yeah. now they can actually damage the community. Mm. Uh, and I had this, this, this thing happening because I didn't <coughs> give enough guidelines and so I let too much free run and what happened, it became absolute chaos and actually, <laughs> yeah, they are so, yeah. <laughs> so it needs to be a balance between that. Well, uh, can, you share the, uh, can you share the story about that? Like, because that's very interesting. I see that like, it's yeah. very important to move from like, being one leader to the community being a, a self-sustaining organism and then I feel like 
having members organize their own events and being a creator is very important part of it. And it yeah. feels like you have a story of where you oh, tried I got this. So, oh, Jesus, I got so many stories. Uh, whether in a, in a utopian world, a community which is self-organizing is awesome. How well is this working in society? Pretty many examples. <laughs> Perfect, right? <laughs> uh, even, even then. Even then, but there are guidelines on what to do and what not to do at Burning Man. You've heard what happens with the mud? Uh, I've, I've heard, yeah, <laughs> I, I, mud aside, like every community needs to have guidelines uh, of, uh, and this is things that come with time, so it's not something that you start at the beginning. A lot of the guidelines or the code of conduct comes into place. For example, we had uh, a situation when we, we got different groups uh, that they wanted a volunteer to collaborate together and organize spin-off events. Of GDEX. This was a way to give our community the power for them to run the events. Uh, we had people that uh, screwed up some of the relationships that we had with the venue because they didn't know how to deal with the venue. We had people that actually they weren't the right fit in collaborating on a project together. So actually it became a shit show and they started fighting <laughs> while running the project. So now then we had two cancellations because they couldn't stand the other people and they want to see them anymore. Uh, we had uh, someone that became very verbally abusive towards someone else that we had to kick out of the community. And that be got us to create an entire code of conduct of what needs to be done and what not needs to be done and what we stand for and how we operate within the community. Uh, so there are these things that... Um, so now what I find is that I found that works for me, everyone will find a different way. What works for me is to select the community leaders. I need to find someone that has the same values uh, and also they are trained to become community leaders because you're a community manager. People think, oh, you know, it's just a community manager. How many things do you do to manage the community? Uh, a lot. Give, me, give me an example of some of your day-to-day -day activities on this. And this is just probably skimming the surface yeah. of, of what you're doing. And that goes to say that even if you're throwing someone at the deep end and say, okay, you now run this part of the community, or uh, I think an, an element of training is good if you want to preserve the value of the community, because the members are the first one to leave if they don't find uh, what, what they came in for. Yes. That's, that's a very good point because I had people that they're very enthusiastic and they join the community straight away and they want to do something. But I've been building this community for 10 years. So you're missing all the context. So even before now, we don't give any opportunities to people that have not been at least three months and they've been very active and we've seen them. Because I need to see how you act. I need to yeah. see how you operate. I'm not, like, I'm not letting you screw up my entire business I built for 10 years. And, and best case scenario, you know, you're the right person. You're the right fit but I've made too many wrong judgments that now it's like, okay, let me just observe you, how you show up, who you are. You want to do something great, let me keep you in mind, and then we can, uh, we can maybe do something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I think there's one more layer to it, and I've experienced it as well, is that from first sight, it seems like it's a good community for you, but actually if you learn deeper, the values are actually not the same, and this is why there's also a disconnect, and mm -hmm. I uh, saw superficially that like, oh, it looks like a great community, but actually when I spent more time there, I saw like, oh, they were doing actually things for the wrong reasons, and mm -hmm. this is why also they didn't, you know, maybe let uh, me have a certain part of it, because I was driven by something else that was no. in conflict with what was the... That, that can happen, there are so many things that happen. And you only learn by being part of that community yeah. for a while. And after that, also later, when you look back, you're like, 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a good point. Like you have this code of conduct, conduct which I believe is probably going to be great, but no one probably reads it, right? The only way that people actually get to know your values is by being part of that community. I, uh, absolutely. And also reinforcing things like, for example, at the beginning of every meeting, we reinforce. Yes. Uh, we're not reading through the code of conduct. The code of conduct there was created literally because we needed to have something that if we have to kick out someone. Yes, if it goes wrong, you need something. Legally, like yeah. legally, because we went through mediation with somebody, with some, some of the weird shit happening. Like it's just with volume, it happens. With a thousand, two hundred members, something happens. Uh, but most of the time is a, you know, subtly remind uh, when we do a training and we send people in breakout rooms. Remember that people are just sharing their opinions. So all you do, if someone shares their opinion, you don't like, you say thank you, you move on and you don't apply. Uh, some like this things set the scene, set the rules yeah. every time on how the interactions are, are made. Uh, it's by how you yeah. behave and not what you put in writing. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Let's do one more question. Can I do two? Okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm open to it. I am open to the bad review because not a, who likes to be rejected <laughs> as a human being? No one does. Uh, they, uh, and it happened that we had people that uh, they were not behaving the right way. That like our, We have a lot of women in our community. Uh, we had one person that was very misogynistic in some of the jokes that he was doing. Let them know once, let them know twice. And third time I say, okay, right now we are receiving complaint that makes people feel uncomfortable. So we are asking you to leave. We had a bad review. How oh, this is not, it was, everyone in the marketing says this is a welcoming place. I was not welcome. Mm -hmm. And that's the review that they put out. Uh, I know I made the right decision, so I got to leave with that review. And I'm okay with that. Uh, and at the same time, we will let people know in advance. So it's not that, I mean, there are some scenarios where we will, that are not acceptable. Like if you punch someone in the face, you're out of the community, like physical violence. Mm -hmm. But if it is uh, some, like, for example, some words or something happened between two members, yeah. we will look at what happened and then we will give people a warning and say, okay, this is not what we accept as a behavior. Know that for next time. If we see that it happens again, then we kick them out. Right. So there is a, no, it never, it never happened that we kicked someone out without letting them know before about what was the issue that they were causing from our side. Mm -hmm. okay. Cool. Um, one more question about measuring mm -hmm. the health of the community. So when you're operating at a scale of more than a thousand members, for yeah. example, how do you measure if the community is actually healthy? Because you can't look at each individual anymore. At least for me, I don't know. What do you define by health? So is it a positive community that is yeah, we will do yearly surveys. So we do yearly sur for that we do yearly surveys, okay. and also we have an eye um, on the community. So now we have community ambassadors. Uh, every time we have a meeting, uh, we have community ambassadors that their role is just to hear what's going on, and then they report to me or the community manager if there is something off. So if they hear something like big complaints. If uh, they see a situation that uh, goes uh, borderline with the code of conduct uh, or we do a training, uh, one of the things that I ask my ambassadors uh, or the team is that, is there any red flag? That's something that I need to know, something that happened that left you. That's part of our process of reviewing every session that we do. And then every year we do a, we do a survey. And then uh, also we see it from uh, what people are sharing. Uh, if we see that not many people are sharing, uh, means that my, something might be off. But I'm not uh, judging that from sharing because some people are happy, but they just not share. Then I just talk about it. Like, so, yeah. so you don't measure like number of posts or like, no, because uh, everyone has a different way of engaging in a community. Uh, the majority of people actually engage in a community in a very silent way. So if your engagement is uh, your only measure of the success of a community. Am I be completely missing the mark because what you're then forcing is forcing people to engage? I'm like, I'm just happy to, to watch. I don't need to talk every day. I don't need to, to, to tell how amazing this is every five minutes. 
I'm okay. I'm good. Just the fact that I'm staying here says that I'm happy. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, that's that's a lesson that I've learned because I was pushing engagement because I, I was thinking that engagement needs to be, if people are happy, they need to say that they're happy. They need to engage, they need to attend, they need to participate. But some people, their level of happiness is just being able to dip in and out where they want. And that's how they want to participate. So as long as at the end the survey is positive, it gives me positive marks, then I know I'm doing a good thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, is it quick? Like we... I think it's quick. <laughs> 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 <'Cause>, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, like, is it something where you're doing these events, you're getting feedback at the events, if you like it or not, or like... Yeah, uh, uh, so it depends if they are in person or online. Uh, but every event that we do, or every training that we do, we have an end of the training survey. So we survey in that moment for the people that are there. And then we have a bigger survey throughout the community, yeah. which helps us also refine uh, the products and adjust our services to the community, because we will ask them if our services are relevant, if we need to change something, if they are happy or not happy, something that maybe we're using before, we see not many people are using, we will ask them, do you still think this is relevant for you? Because we don't see many people using this particular service. Uh, so that becomes a much broader survey, but in the short, we always uh, uh, keep an eye on what's, and, and online is more difficult to do, but what's said in between conversations between people, because that's when they, most of the time the truth comes out. Uh, people will say in a survey, oh, everything is great. And then uh, they told to the person next, like, oh, I didn't like this, and they didn't like that. And didn't like that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so maybe a real quick summary of, like, if someone doesn't have a community yet, wants to, uh, wants to start from scratch, basically, I guess it's... Mm. I've, got, I've got four things that you can think about uh, uh, in terms of running a community and uh, starting your community from scratch in terms of thinking and planning. Mm -hmm. Um, one uh, is, uh, on a strategic level, thinking about the belief first. Because uh, the, the belief is, uh, what is the belief that you, that you have, the beliefs that you have, and also the beliefs that your ideal members have? Because that's what creates a, a feeling of, uh, you, you are like me. Right? For example, the, the belief here, without even knowing it, that I'm assuming, is that you know, we, we love collaboration. Because someone that doesn't love collaboration doesn't, it's not part of a community. There is a belief of, I am a founder. I'm a founder, so that's why I'm here. And so that's the belief that they have. So having an idea of what is the belief that I have. So for example, the belief that I have in GTEx is that is about um, working together and collaborating together. And so now we were looking for people that have the same one. If you don't like to collaborate with others, there's nothing wrong with you, it's just not the, not the right community for you. So that's the belief for, first. The second is the cause. Um, the cause, uh, every community needs to have uh, something that they're moving towards. A goal that they're moving towards, a cause that they are championing. Because uh, if something is still, then uh, people will jump ship very often. They will not feel part of something bigger than themselves. So for example, you know, charities do this very well. The cause uh, for a lot of charities, we, we want to eradicate homelessness. Let's work together to eradicate homelessness. In my community is about creating recurring revenues. That's the cause of our community. It's like work together to create sustainable businesses and make sure that everyone has enough recurring revenues. So everyone is in the same one. So when you're creating it, think about the cause that your community is fighting for. Uh, the third aspect is belonging. This is more strategic on how do you make people feel, I belong here. And it can be with uh, what you say, how you set things up. For example, one of the things that we do immediately when someone joins our community is to make a con an introduction to another member. Mm -hmm. Because uh, meeting someone else might make you feel meeting the right person. And I, I, and I always introduce them or we introduce them to someone that they know they can click. In this way, you will feel, oh, you're connecting me with a good person. I feel like I belong here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then another thing uh, is uh, platform. Then the final one is platform. What platform are you going to use to engage your community? Uh, whether it's WhatsApp, whether it's Slack, whether it's Facebook, uh, this in-person event, this is a platform. This venue is a platform. 
so starting from belief, what beliefs do I want uh, my community members, do, do the ideal members have, and what beliefs do I have that meet them? Uh, the cause, what we are working towards, belonging, how do you make people feel they belong here, and on platform, how you're facilitating this through the platform. So this is becomes more like a checklist to, to create the community. What's your favorite platform? For community, still Facebook. Uh, no, some, a lot of people have uh, resistance on Facebook and there is a lot of wrong things with Facebook. But I've not found another platform that runs community better than Facebook. I think there is a lot of community platforms that people want to move away from social media. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that the adoption is very slow. Because if I'm on Facebook or on LinkedIn or whatever platform I use, I see the post and I can engage because of reaction. Mm -hmm. If I'm on WhatsApp, I'm going on WhatsApp because of another myriad of reasons. Uh, while I need to remember to log in somewhere else, which I don't need in my life, another place to log in, by the way, uh, to then connect with others and have conversation with others. And so a lot of uh, people that build uh, communities on separate platforms, actually, they, maybe they had very success, successful community on social media. They found that the engagement dropped massively. So I would use, still, use, um, still use Facebook uh, for mine, but every target audience is different. Yeah, places where people already go. I'm so sorry, guys, but we're really, uh, we're really running, running out, out of out time, of... so we I'll can. Be, do... I'll be here, by the way, so you can ask me any question, uh, any question that you want. I'll be here for yeah. time. Yeah. No, no, but I'm I'm here for it. And also, actually, uh, for if if you if you get the kit, we're gonna put the the thing up again. But uh, I'm still in Amsterdam tomorrow uh, for, for time, so if you want to meet for coffee or whatever. Um. Yeah, and if it's like a really interesting topic, like we can do maybe another separate session, another like month Online, of the year or yeah, whatever. Exactly. But uh, yeah, I know it's a big topic. We'll do a webinar. Uh, yeah. yeah, let's do a webinar. <laughs> also. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, but. Yeah, we can talk about this for a lot longer and all the details and how to, to, to grow a good community. But I think this is a lot of value in just like 45 minutes or whatever it was. So yeah, thank you so much for uh, thank you sharing for all your here. insights. Thank you, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So to, um, to close this evening, I have a couple of quick announcements and I'm famous for messing up my announcements. That's why I have a note. I'm also able to mess up my announcement when I have a note, so. <laughs> That's a superpower. Yeah, it's, it's very That's cool, yeah. We all have our superpowers. That could be your, your elevator pitch when you are introducing yourself. Yeah, the thing is I'll probably forget half of that. Exactly. <laughs> Which is proof of my super, anyway. Um, we're already over time, so let's see. Yeah, there's a couple of practical things. One of them being if you um, want to get uh, your webinar kit, it's like, what is it again? Uh, Webinarconversionkit.com. Yes, webinar. Uh, that's where you can go. Or there is my laptop there with a QR code. So you can scan the QR code and have the session with me. Yeah. Also, a big thank you to Jana, to StartDoc, for um, helping to put this event together. Without partnerships, like as you told, it's a lot of work to set up a community and without partnerships to um, uh, this like wouldn't be possible. Like, so thank you so much. Um, then, yeah, this is an um, event of the community I'm uh, running for founders. So it's basically um, a place for founders to connect with other founders. So you can make relevant new connections, but also share insights, le learn new things to bring your business to a next level. So we're all founders in the process of growing, improving our business. And the community is called No More Networking because it's all about events that either feel like a fun evening out with friends. So one of the things I do is founders table where it's like we have a dinner together and a lot of connection activities and it feels just like a fun evening out. It's actually like some people here have already been here and uh, yeah, a lot of people keep coming back. So that's a good sign. And then these things, uh, these events are Founders Academy, where we actually deep dive into a topic where you both hopefully learn skills that might just be the insight to take your business to a next level. And it's also exclusively for founders, so you get also to meet other founders with a similar challenge. So it's always uh, a double-edged sword. So if you want to know more about the community, because you can also uh, join as a member, 
uh, just talk to me. You can, uh, like, I'll be, okay, m we have to leave this venue at some point, I'm aware, but um, <laughs> <laughs> we're getting kicked out very soon. Um, but you can uh, talk to me here or send me a message on WhatsApp if you're in the WhatsApp group or just email marcel at nomornetworking.com if you're interested in joining the core community and then you have access to all of these events, the Founders Table, the Founders Academy. There will be an online platform to connect with other founders. Um, there will be opportunities to promote uh, your business and what you're working on. So everything to take your business to the next level. So if you're interested in that, you can just uh, let me know through email or just talk to me. Then, yeah, I'm now going to read very carefully because I've never not messed this up. <laughs> yeah, so all is left is the upcoming events, uh, if you're interested in joining those. Um, in October, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I understand how weird this must look as, you're, as a spectator, but <laughs> it's brilliant. It's part of the process. <laughs> So in October, we have an event that's about driving behavioral change. So if you're a leader, you have a team and you want to impact how um, people behave within like either your work or with, uh, in the communication with other people, this event is all about that. So there's very experienced speaker coming in. Um, he normally charges like a bunch of money to, to give talks like that, but uh, he's doing it for our community as well because it's a new talk for him. So um, yeah, that's one of the events for October. That's the Founders Academy. Then it's the Founders Table in uh, October. I think it's October 11 or something. So it's a, an event exclusively for founders, entrepreneurs, and we share a dinner together with connection activities. It will be at a place called Dining 27, which is a super nice private dining place. Um, so for the people who are already a No More Networking member, the events are included, so you get access for free. And uh, otherwise, I believe it's like 85 euros plus 21% tax or something like that. If you, uh, Because every event also has some separate guest tickets. Um, so that would be the founder's table for the upcoming months. And then an event I'm really excited about. It's called Business Nightmare Stories. So I actually rented the comedy cafe in Amsterdam and we'll have entrepreneurs sharing their fuck up stories and what we can learn from them. So if you have a story, That's cool. uh, then you're brave enough to share that with, uh, uh, and it will be like a, a nice fun evening with a comedian as an MC and everything. So if you're brave enough to share that story and we'll brief you as well and make the, like help you make it a nice story, let me know. Marcel at nomornetworking.com and also Soon the registration will open, so there's a lot of guest tickets for that event, so you can uh, just join that as well. How so, big is that audience? Hmm? How big is that audience? I think maybe 50 people, 50 to 100 maybe. So this is big, yeah, Comedy Cafe is a bigger, bigger venue, so I hope we'll get to, like, to sell 50 to 100 tickets. <laughs> I actually depends if people are going to be uncom more uncomfortable. I want the the primary focus is always on the in-person event. Yeah. So if it makes people more uncomfortable and then they don't want to share, then maybe no. Yeah, yeah. So I'll ask. You need to repeat then this one. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but if you're interested in uh, sharing your story there, or if you uh, would like to just attend and check it out because there will be future events as well. Um, yeah, just let me know or go to normalnetworking.com slash events. Okay.